This is The Second Studio, hosted by the Architecture and Design Office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Bordarone. This week, it's just the two of us, and we're doing a project companion recording. And the topic of this week is home remodels. And we're talking about... Oh, yep, go ahead. And we're talking about home remodels because we do love remodels, and also they are very, very different from doing new homes. There are nuances and challenges that come with remodels that new homes do not present. And so what we're going to do today is talk about some of those things and how we address them in our process with our office um, with remodels and also along the way some tips for clients and things that they can be mindful of as they're preparing for the project and going through it right yeah that's some pretty exciting stuff right there <laughs> sounds good so one of the first things you should do if you're a client and you're embarking on a remodel project is to think about your project scope and you probably want to think about this even before you hire your architect or designer and the contractor yeah, and the scope is interesting. I feel like when we meet clients, uh, we we meet clients who know exactly what they need for the remodel to happen. They have a wish list. They know they need a new kitchen, a new bathroom. They need to tear down a wall. They would need more windows. Mm -hmm. Like they're very much aware and in tune with what they think needs to take place in order for the home to be bettered. Like very specific, very specific things. wish list. Yeah. And sometimes it's a good start. Sometimes it's the way to go. Sometimes we need to kind of come in and maybe rethink about the scope. But it's very good, right? Mm -hmm. Having that kind of starting point. On the other end of the spectrum, we also meet with clients who do not know what needs to happen in order to make the home better. And that's understandable. They're not the architect, they're not designers. They don't know what moves can better a space. You know, what? why does this room feel not good? Is it the size? Is it the flow? Is it the light? So we're here to help, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes you have people who are kind of in between the two. They have some sort of wish list, but sometimes it's so specific and so minor in the gesture that you know oh i want to replace interior doors i want to have new shades and you have to see is that going to be enough to make a good impact on the remodel do we need to think about other things yeah in any case i think uh, being in any of these different client profile when you approach an architect or a designer is fine like, you know our role is to help you come up with the scope and the best approach to make the home better if you know, if you have a good idea, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Yeah, I think you highlight a number of good points. The first is that the, there's no there's no limit to how in depth a client should think about the project scope, right? It's not a bad thing to be hyper specific, but I think if you are that way, and let's say you're more of a Type A personality, or you've lived in the home for a very long time, so you've thought about these things over a number of years, if you are that way. It still makes sense for you to be very, very open with your architect slash designer and tell them, I have this list, but I totally want you to give me ideas on how to improve it. The other thing you brought up is a very important distinction between scope and vision. And a lot of times clients confuse those two things. Yeah. Another way to think about it is the what versus the why. Everyone has a list of what they want. I want X, Y, Z, A, B, C, what, da, 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 da. But often what's lacking, sometimes what's lacking is the why. Like, what is the larger purpose of this remodel? What do you want the, the new house to give you in the end? What is your vision for it? How do you want to make it, how do you want it to make you feel, right? And as architects, we have to have both things. So as you said, one of the, one of the things that surprises clients is that when we are hired, we do not just take their list of stuff and roll with it. No, we 100% I mean, do that. Don't no. do that. Um, we end up trying to figure out both, right? And the goal is to understand both to then see how they're misaligned and what the gaps exist. So if you have a vision and you have a list of, of, of scope requirements, it's our job to say, okay, if you really want that vision, that scope has to change. Some Actually, sometimes it's you have to increase the scope and some, you know, some, half the time it's like, you should actually consider decreasing the scope. You don't need to do this to achieve this vision. We had, you know, we had a client who came to us and wanted to have five bedrooms, right, in in the home being remodeled and, and extended. And one of our questions was, well, why do you need five bedrooms? Because by the time the house would be done, your kids would have moved out. Yeah. So you're going to end up with actually four bedrooms that are completely empty most of the time. And this is your forever and retirement home. Uh, don't you think maybe we could recapture that square footage into spaces that are more meaningful for you in your daily life once you retire? 90% of the time, um, yeah. And that's something that 
maybe you know maybe people could be a bit shocked by or maybe sometimes they haven't thought about those things because let's be honest i feel like society is formatting us to all think in the same way mm -hmm. which is very impersonal to anybody's lifestyle and it's not that five bedroom is bad it's just maybe it won't feel it won't fit that specific couple's lifestyle at this time of their life sure you know if you have three kids you need five bedrooms right if yeah. it's just the two of you you probably don't and in that case i think what we ended up figuring out was still having that same number of rooms so that in the future if they chose to sell the house they could be staged as bedrooms but laying them out and designing them in a way where they f they were and felt like and looked like other types of spaces like a creative um, art studio or a gym or whatever else we had in, in the program mm -hmm. right so I think that's one of the things that we do, and frankly, I think any good architecture office would do, is question the scope um, and the program um, to make it something that's personal to whoever the client is. That's actually one interesting data when we uh, get brought on projects too, is you know, oftentimes remodels happen either of because it just happens to align with a new purchase. Somebody bought a home, it doesn't meet their expectation on who they are, they wanted to fit who they are so they wanted to remodel or the home is outdated they've been there for 20 years and they get tired of things they just want fresh air or maybe they're they're planning of their next phase in life which is let's say retirement and they need to downsize or kind of reconfigure the home to make sense yeah yeah um, so it's it's very important to understand the scope but also kind of like the what, how does this new house is going to fit into this specific chapter and the next chapter of your life? And honestly, the, the best clients from my perspective are the ones probably who have that vision mm -hmm. or a vague kind of sense of what that vision and larger outcome is, but they don't know how to get there. Because usually that means those people are really open to hearing how we get there. Um, a, an analogy that I kind of like to use is like if you were a cook or a baker and you're creating a recipe right um you would want to start off with like what is the outcome i'm trying to achieve am i creating a main course that's meant to be um you know salty or am i creating a dessert that's meant to be sweet and have notes of x y and z if i'm creating a dessert i can work back from there and decide okay these are the ingredients i'm going to use but oftentimes people are like okay i'm creating a dessert right it's going to be the sweet whatever delicate thing and my ingredients are chicken pork salt and <laughs> pepper and then we come in and we're like well if we're trying to create a dessert let's think about the dessert and then pick the ingredients we need to get there that right. makes sense for that i'm sure anyone who cooks is like that's a terrible analogy <laughs> <That's right. laughs> i don't know if you're cooking well, i'm sure there is some chicken and dessert out there um so that's all talking about scope now one of the things that's very different about remodels versus new construction obviously is that in a, in a remodel we're working with an existing structure but really that fact is the root of all of the nuances and frankly challenges that come with remodels and, um, even more specifically it means that we're working with a building and none of us us the architect the contractor or you the client none of us know precisely and with full certainty what is inside of that structure what's inside of the walls right, and the status of right. it and basically until we start demolition it's interesting because i feel like with remodels you have to be prepared to have bad surprises oh, yeah. as soon as you start opening yeah. things up because honestly and it's kind of something that's scary when you know like people buy houses is that you don't know what it's made of <laughs> and you only find out what you but once you start taking it apart, which, you know, is, is kind of crazy. And there is no like refund policy once you find out what it's made of. You know, we had this project where we started, uh, we did a pretty good interior gut remodel and we started opening the walls and the floors and, you know, the, the heated floor system that was broadly advertised on the realtor's ad yeah. actually ended up just being like some plastic hose that they threw in between floor joists that they covered up with no the flooring. Insulation, no insulation, no no nothing. insulation the system was crappy and you know those are homes that you buy for millions of dollars yeah. and if i was the the homeowner who bought that i would be pissed yeah. i would be pissed so you know that's like an additional cost you kind of have to to build in within your budget there is the budget that's the ideal number and, and what you can afford 
And part of that number is the new things we're going to be doing. And part of that number is the things we're going to have to fix after we start opening up the walls and yeah, the floors. Definitely. And that sometimes it's, it's things that clients don't want to think about or don't even think about because for them it looks fine when everything is, you know, looking the way it looks, you know, so why should there be any issues? It's one of the first things that we always tell clients when we're doing a remodel project is you should know upfront when we get to construction, there are going to be surprises. There is. And there might be some good ones, but there's likely going to be ones that are going to make it more challenging and you're going to have to make tough decisions. And that's the, and that's yeah. the difference between, like you said, like new construction and remodel is that if you think about a remodel project as like a surgery, right? Yeah. You can do as much planning and x-rays and discussion and, and doctor exams and visits and, and all of that to plan for the D-Day the, the of the surgery, mm -hmm. right? But once they start opening you up, they're going to see things that they didn't see before or they couldn't see with the tools that they had. And there's going to be improvisation. There's going to be solution that's going to need to be decided and things are going to have to change depending on what's inside, yeah. right? Uh, so talking about the, the process, so before we start designing, before we put pen to paper, the first thing we do is, is we call it a comprehensive design analysis. And there's many things that are included with that, but, but one of them is just to visit the property in person. It's yeah. very basic, but it's incredibly important. Now, this is for a number of reasons. One, it's for us to get a very deep understanding of what the architecture of the home is what the architecture is trying to express and what it is stating. And we we go there and we absorb, we immerse ourselves, we listen to what it's trying to, to, to be mm -hmm. and what it's, what it's not, what it's failing at too. But equally important is to see that existing house with the clients in it and to see how they live in the home. So, and that's that's very, very critical, especially if it's remote, even if it's a new home, we still wanna visit your existing home, your current one and see how you live. And it's to understand your living patterns and who you are and all of that stuff. And it's again to see how you, your current lifestyle and your projected future desired lifestyle, how that misaligns or aligns with the existing structure, right? right? And that's a very important thing because we're going to create this, remodel it so it now fits what you want to be. And in order to do that, we need to understand what the discrepancy is. So, so we kind of do that and it's more of a kind of a discovery side visit, right? Mm -hmm. We're just kind of like observing, just getting a feel for it. And then of course we do like a 3D scan of the place. So, you know, sometimes if we're lucky, clients have existing plans and, and drawings so we can start from that. Some other times they don't. So what we do is we come, we scan the house. So at least we have a, a base to start on, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, it's a good enough tool for us to just start playing around, you know, uh, with the floor plan, for example, and, and kind of like the concepts mm -hmm. and just get us going and see what's feasible. Yeah, get us going. That's a good point. Because what also happens very often with, with these houses is we will come back to the site pretty shortly after, again, for a longer period of time and just be at the property, on, on the property, walking around it, walking outside the house, inside the house to try and understand it even more. And it's, it's, you're looking at, you know, wind, are you feeling wind? You're looking at light, looking at shadow. You're looking at, um, flow of circulation. You're looking at all of those things. And it usually takes a couple of times to really get it. Um, I remember hearing from Quentin Tarantino, there's a clip of him talking that when he goes to see a movie, he sees it twice. He probably sees all the movies like a hundred times, but he always sees a movie twice in a theater. The first time he goes, it's by himself just to experience the movie in a very direct pure sense and then he goes again later on with his you know friends and colleagues for like a night out and i think that's very interesting because with complex projects like houses or movies it takes a couple times before you truly understand what you're working yeah. with and you know all this analysis stuff might seem like it's overkill uh for for whatever size project but it's not because this is the information that's going to lead to interesting solutions. So cool design. It's also what's going to allow us to be much more efficient in the design process because now we're designing based on a good solid foundation of information and a diagnosis essentially. We're not just guessing and throwing a, a dart in the dark, but we've, we're basing it off of real information that we've gained. That being said though, if you're just doing a bathroom remodel, that the process <laughs> would probably be a bit simpler. Yeah. But let's yeah. say if you're doing like an extensive remodel of your home, uh, those are things. It's basically, again, it's kind of like before you start 
going to buy new ingredients, you kind of open up your pantry, your pantry and you see what's there, right? Yeah, Is yeah, there any good exactly. stuff that we can use here, you know? I do want to say that I think in the design of a remodel, there is roughly three different types of remodels or three different approaches, right? Okay. Um, the first is that sometimes we come across houses that have a very, very strong architectural identity and style and character to right, them. Right, right. And in those cases, uh, I believe that our responsibility is to honor and respect what's there and then to, to, and to understand it and to enhance what's there so it feels more contemporary a lot of times. It doesn't feel as outdated. These are common things that come up. And also, obviously, so it fits that the, again, the future lifestyle of the people living there. But some houses, they just do. They have some kind of quality to them that's really amazing. And it's I, I think it would be irresponsible of us to come in and just uh, ignore it. Which, which I do see sometimes, remod like the remodel should not feel like a remodel in the end, right? It should feel like it was always meant to be this way. It's interesting you said that, yeah. I mean, we had this project where um, it was a couple, they were looking to move, and but they really loved their house. It's not like, you know, they didn't care about their house. Yeah. They truly, heart like, full-heartedly, like, loved their home, and their home was very special. You could tell that an architect had designed it in every single corner, right? It was it was actually pretty interesting. And as architects, we, we do have respect for the work of other architects, sure. you know, and especially if people buy these homes rather than, like, cookie-cutter home. Like, it means something, right? Yeah. And the house was interesting enough, but like you said, maybe some of the finishes, some of the elements were either incomplete or outdated or missing, or maybe it wasn't the, quite the right fit. Mm -hmm. and, and those projects are very interesting because it's almost like, it's almost like, um, let's say if, if someone started a sketch mm -hmm. and you have to finish it, mm -hmm. and you, wanna, you don't wanna finish in the manner of that first person because you know time has passed mm -hmm. and it's understood that it's gonna be a, 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 a dual authorship of mm -hmm. that sketch, right? But they have to blend it nicely. So if somebody was to step in the home, they couldn't tell They'd that it was remodeled yeah. or like two people design it. And that's when it's seamless, that's the most successful types of projects. So this one was very interesting because it had a strong identity. It had a, um, you know, a strong design components, but we managed to just bring in just a piece or just replace the pieces that were missing. And at the end, the client was completely blown away because they were like, we didn't do a whole lot, let's say, compared to like other projects, but we did enough that the house felt complete. And they mm -hmm. said that themselves, they were like, you know, like in the, the, the kitchen entry space, the, the love space, we were just missing that light fixture to just complete complete the design. Mm. And they couldn't point they couldn't point which element was missing, but they always felt like something was missing. And um, it, it's very satisfying for us when we we kind of find like the last pieces of the puzzle, you know, to complete the full picture and, and we managed to do it in a way that no one even would know that uh, it was done after the fact. Yeah, what's interesting too with, with that particular project and those clients is they were very game to do more work, I think. Yeah. And I think folks are sometimes surprised when we're talking with them and they ask that question of, well, should we do more? And we say, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, that means less fee for you. I'm like, yeah, but it's not the right thing to do. But more isn't we're, always We're not going to do it. Um, the second type of house that we see, uh, which requires more work, is, is when the house um is trying to have an architectural identity or has like shadows or or slivers of an architectural um statement that's being made but it's not happening and those require much more uh construction effort right those require us to do much more interpretation i would say of what the house could become and finish like the back half of the story and a lot of houses are like this where they have uh, maybe two, three, four, five, six different kind of st statements that are being made in, in their design gestures. And it's our job to do an analysis to see which ones are the most, are the strongest and the most appropriate for that client. So as an example, uh, th there was one project, that, uh, there was a house in Hollywood Hills, and it was kind of composed of uh one of the gestures of the mini gestures it had one of the gestures was these kind of ro uh, white rotated boxes mm -hmm. that was like one thing and then the first floor had like a different thing going on and then the back patio deck had like a third thing going on and the kitchen was another thing 
And so it makes this very unclear statement that doesn't feel good to live in. It also had problems because the furniture wasn't laid out to, to work with those other things I mentioned. So like all this stuff happening, right? And for a lot of folks, they, they feel it. They say to us, like, this doesn't feel right. I don't know what's going on here. And that's where it becomes more like, like we're acting kind of like an archaeologist or something. And we're kind of digging uh, to see the layers and then to figure out, again, which ones are make sense to, to kind of go with and to pick up on. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting because it is very much, our work very much starts about understanding what is the house. And in this case, it's really kind of almost running a, <laughs> a, a crash diagnosis you mm -hmm. know like where is the house crashing like what are the things that are not working what are the what are the very many languages that the house is trying to speak and either either we we push forward those languages like to the next level to make it of a stronger presence and character or maybe we decide you know what this is why the house is crashing it's just speaking too many languages at once yeah. and maybe this one is the one that matters most or maybe this one matters most here but doesn't make sense there right mm -hmm. so sometimes we do have to understand in order to either push forward or completely reject something another analogy is if again when you're writing a story i mean architecture is really it's, it's the same thing as creating a story and a story has to have a clarity has to have a thesis has, has to have typically a beginning middle and end there's a point to it there's a direction to it and everything that's written in that story serves the storyline and um, that clarity is what makes a story successful. It's the same thing with architecture and with houses. So most of the time, a lot of the times with remodels, the problem that houses have is they aren't clear with whatever it is they're trying to do. Um, not to talk about teaching, but that's this problem students have too. They, they throw in a bunch of stuff and like, you have way too many ideas in this project. You have way too many ideas in this story, way too many ideas in this painting or whatever it might be. Distill it down to the essence. And sometimes, you know, I have to admit, sometimes it comes from the clients too. Sometimes sure. the clients just has, they have, they have too much on the wish list. And, um, you know, and you kind of can tell in, in some of the homes that we visit, you know, that were purchased, for example, is that the previous owner probably just, you know, got the work done with a contractor or someone and never had anyone telling them they have too many ideas. Mm -hmm. And you could count that it just ends up being a shit show. So I think, you know, taking the time to understand, think, look back and then move forward and make sense because otherwise you just end up executing the client's wish list and sometimes yeah, it doesn't no. make sense. That's why the vision is important. Yeah, the vision is key. The third type of house is where it has, it's totally generic. There's nothing interesting at all about it. There's no architectural statement. There's no identity. There's no character. There's none of that stuff. Which I think those are probably the most common ones, honestly. And, it's, yeah. And yeah. It is because you, guess what? When people sell their home, what are they going to do? They're going to repaint. They're going to fix the kitchen. They're going to fix the bathroom. And they're going to fix it for the next person, the buyer. And they want to oh, attract sorry. as many people as they can, right? So the, 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 the facelift of the house is very vanilla, very generic, could be appealing to anybody. It's, 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 um, it has no identity yeah. per se because... Because the, the, I mean, what I think what people don't get is that because the point is actually for you to buy the house and put your identity on it. Mm. You're not supposed to buy the house the way it was remodeled for the sale and live in that because that's, it, it, it's not, it, it could be yeah. for anybody, <clears throat> right? It's like so, wearing generic clothing or something. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and I mean, of course, you know, I understand it depends on the price point and the budget. Some people just buy it and keep it that way because they can afford it and that's fine. It's clean, it's moving ready and that's totally fine. But for clients who do have a budget and do want the home to feel like it's theirs, um, it's important to, you know, to, to bring their personality into the house. I mean, yep. you know, like, like my sister just bought a house that's extremely realtor looking and I'm like, she's a colorful young person, very energetic, and the house looks nothing like her, yeah. right? So at, at, at some point, something's going to have to to give <laughs> in order to make the relationship work. It's like, yeah, you know. I think you're totally right, though, that the prepping a home for sale process is what leads to this vanilla, market-driven, yeah. faceless uh, s slew of houses. And uh, we've certainly come across that. Um, and in those cases, you know, we're tasked with 
Give us a whole vision. Give us something. We're starting from scratch almost. Give us something. But again, even in those cases, um, we we the the ideas doesn't. It's not they don't come out of a black bag. They still come from an understanding of the client, and in that case, the one the house I'm thinking of the site. The backyard, which was phenomenal. All right, that was the one thing that was good about the house was the backyard. <laughs> it wasn't even the house, it was the backyard. And then the view out to the front and then capturing those views and weaving all of that into a larger um, narrative. But yeah, in some cases, there's nothing there. And you really have to, to just completely ignore almost all of the things that exist mm -hmm. to, to give it new life. It's almost like it's um, it's kind of a blank slate. It's a blank slate, but you're keeping some of the walls and the structure. Of course, you know of course. that's yeah, yeah. what it is. So now talking about the design process itself and a little bit uh, with the construction again, some of the challenges that happened with remote with uh, remodels and how we approach those challenges. Uh, one of the things that we like to do um, in terms of the initial design phase is to propose different options, and we do this almost at any design pre presentation anyway. But I think this is really important in the initial concept sketches, right? And what we do specifically for remodels is we like to show different concept sketches that are each for different scopes of work, different amounts of construction, but all of them convey and execute the vision that we've kind of talked about and established at least initially, right? So it'll be like, here's option one. This is what we do with the least amount of work to get to where you want. This is option two, this is a little more work, and this is option three, where it's the most amount of work, you know, relative to the budget you have in mind, and maybe a little bit even beyond that. And that's kind of the range. And I think that's very helpful because it's the f a lot of times the first time that people actually see, like visually, their ideas put down on paper, but in different ways. And it, it helps them understand, okay, you're right. Like if we do this, this more work, the gains I can see it in yeah. your documentation, the presentation is very clear. We, we've got to do that. That's that's totally worth it. And other times it's like, yeah, it, we can be we can operate with a small scope in this f space and it'll be really effective. So let's do that for that space. Yeah, no, I think it's important because because again, like there is not one way to go about things to make it work. There is different ways. And I feel like also clients should have the choice in choosing which way they want to approach the remodel. <clears throat> and also honestly for them to question what is actually the most important for them. Mm -hmm. Is it just the finishes of the bathroom? Is it like the layout? Is it like the whole floor plan that just doesn't feel right? And therefore they feel for them it's important that the whole floor plan feels right. It's kind of like a way to gauge their their feeling of, of hierarchy of the scope and, and what is at the top of their list and what is maybe a bit less. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, again, sometimes when clients reach out, the, on top of their list is the finishes of the bathroom and the number of sinks, right. you know, and at the end of this process, when they see the three options, they actually realize that, no, you know, you open the eyes to me that what was wrong with this space was the whole floor plan is wrong or like well I mean that's it that's it or like yeah. no well you know like my primary suite doesn't feel right because my bathroom has no windows yeah and it's a tiny black box I'm stepping in every time and and so it's you know those sketches and and and, and concept studies are a communication tool right yeah. to kind of you know kind of um, uh, clarify the scope, but also clarify the expectation, the dreams, the communication, you know, the priorities, right? Yeah, what you're saying also too highlights the point that it's it's all a process and really yeah. in a remodel especially, it feels like you're just part of one long conversation with somebody. And it is a conversation in that to, we, we converse, but also like design is very much, we take two or three steps forward, we take three steps forward and then two steps back. And then three steps forward and two steps back um, because it's not possible for any designer or architect when you're working with a client closely and you're doing a custom home in particular to just get it perfect from day one and i think that's one of the piece of advice i would have for clients is is, is be ready for that yeah. um it is it is challenging when clients approach us and they say here's my list i want it done give me a, a quote, do it, and then I want to, then that's it, like a transaction. And that's not the case, um, because as we are producing stuff, we're learning about what's work, what works, and also that's an opportunity for you, the client, to see what actually makes sense and doesn't. The other thing that we do, 
um, with remodels. Because what happens with remodels is once you start construction, you tear down the walls, um, you start to see a bunch of stuff, and then the game plan has to change. Yeah. That's that's the nature of it. And and there's some ways that we can kind of, you know, uh, uh, avoid too many big surprises. Like one, if you're an experienced architect, you go in, you can kind of tell which elements are structural and, and things like that. Or if it's a particular building type you've seen many times before, then you know, okay, this house I've seen 30 times, this, this structure works this way. The contractor also will do some probing in the walls, like make tiny holes and kind of peek around and see what's going on. But during the design phase, what we like to do is design with contingencies. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to design like three different full on houses and say, okay, this is house one. If, if things go well, this is house two. If things don't go well in house three, if things, you know, are really unexpected. What it simply means is, is more like in a particular space, um, we have a good sense that there are some elements that are more likely to uh, have to change because we're going to find something during construction, right? And with that knowledge, we just don't rely on those as being key features in the design of the house, or um, or we, we do have design contingencies and we think, okay, if that has to change, it won't negatively affect what's next to it. Yeah, I mean, usually if 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 those are the big features, um, we will have to, we will know quickly if it's feasible or if it's not feasible, and mm -hmm. if things need to shift slightly or like change size or you know like that's not that's not a deal breaker. You know, sometimes you know recently we've opened a wall in a in a bathroom that we were redoing, and some of the houses, depending on where they were built, too. Sometimes you find some funny stuff, you know, yeah. and we found, for example, a, a drainage pipe from a bathroom above that was running on the wall where we were hoping to have a medicine cabinet, you know, hidden, concealed. Well, no medicine cabinet. So we came up with another solution and it's it's kind of part of the game. So I think we everybody in the team, you know, the architect and the client kind of have to know that some of those smaller things might have to be massaged yeah. around to fit <laughs> that structure that we are opening up. Yeah, and I think for the big things too, like in a lot of these homes, it's you're tearing down walls to create a more open and fluid floor plan. Um, and in those cases, the concern is structural. Uh, is there a post there that's holding up, that's helping support the second floor? And if we take that down, what does that mean? Uh, it just simply means you put a big header or beam above it is what it means. But if there are things and gestures that are significant, then what we would do is talk with the contractor or the structural engineer kind of early on and plan for it. Yeah. And say, we think there's a 50% chance that we're going to have to do this large amount of construction work. And we know that's going to take place or we anticipate it. Um, because at, at, at some point, right, if there's too much of that, it exceeds the budget and the schedule, the client's not going to want to do it. So then we don't design based on that assumption. Yeah. The next point is, I think, for remodelers to try and be as efficient as possible. Hmm. There is, you know, maybe the easy route would be to just ignore the challenges, just remove, demo everything. <laughs> That's true. You could ignore and the challenges. New, and then, you know, it's a remodel yeah. in some ways because yeah, you're keeping yeah. foundation and maybe the, the, the roof framing, but not It's a remodel really. because you're keeping the other part of the house. <laughs> no, and, and, and so I think, you know, Remodels could also become very costly once you start taking down especially structural uh, elements. So if there is ways to be very mindful of, let's say, the, the bones of the home, mm -hmm. right? Or even mindful of the budget and just making very specific moves in very specific instances in order to make the home feel completely different. You don't need to b blow it up completely in order to to do something interesting. And I think that's kind of like where we come from when we approach remodel projects. And that's also why we're doing this kind of like three different levels of um, scope. Yeah. Um, you know, in the in the concept the designs. Options. Yeah. Um, because we're trying to be mindful of, of the gestures that the interventions that we have to do to make it better. And what's interesting with that is there are some cases where it's a very minor thing that has to happen in order for the space to, to actually complete itself um, and other times though you have to rip out a bunch of walls I think also the desire to be efficient and more surgical like you use the the surgery analysis um, earlier um, I was thinking of that as being you know precise and thoughtful with what you do also comes from a place of just not being wasteful period uh, even with people who have a lot of money and they have a, a big budget 
I still don't want to be wasteful, um, both from a financial perspective for the client, for sure, <clears throat> but also from a material perspective. Um, this is perhaps a different topic, but you know, construction is is frankly an extremely wasteful uh, practice. Yeah. A lot of times, there's a huge amount of material waste uh, that occurs with new construction and and even remodels. So I think as a profession, even it makes sense for us to try and be efficient with the resources we have, the material resources, for sustainability purposes as well. The other thing I think in the spirit of being efficient and res and respectful and not wasteful is for us to work very closely with the contractors. Hmm. You know, usually uh, remodels have a budget and, and unless it's unlimited, like we do have to see where the, the money is being placed yep. and understand like where it makes the most sense to put more money versus not. Uh, you know, if you equally spread the budget all around the house, nothing is going to be special. <laughs> so you kind of have to to gauge it and cater it uh, wherever you need it. That's where working with the contractor super early on and looking at those numbers as well as the design concurrently is important. Right. That makes sense. So the final aspect of remodels that makes it challenging from a design perspective is the fact that they place a lot of constraints on what we can do obviously, because we're working with something existing and we're trying to keep walls or keep elements. Uh, and to be clear, some remodels, you know, everything gets torn down except for like two walls. And this recording is not about that. And and most of the time, you, you frankly, you just do that to, to expedite the permitting and approvals process. That's a whole different, basically, strategy. Um, but in these cases where you're actually working design-wise with something. And it, it can be challenging. It, it can be frustrating, frankly, at times, because you feel like you're just stuck. And I sometimes have this this thought of, I could make this so much better, but we have this thing, and it's forcing me to kind of fight with one hand behind my back. However, what always happens in the end is that some really interesting, cool solution is found, and it's not something I, I might have been able to think about on my own, because now I have this external thing, this existing structure that's forcing me, right? It's like the grain of salt that makes the pearl. It's this irritant that's forcing us to think in a new direction and come up with something that, you know, maybe wouldn't have been thought about had we give, been given carte blanche. That's true. That's true. I feel like you're right. Maybe remodels sometimes have the most unique and creative solutions that if we were to start from zero and design a brand new home, we would probably, you know, we'll have more freedom, we'll have more space, we'll have more liberty in how to, you know, lay things out and, and give to that space or the other, right? But when you are confined with an existing situation, you have to make the best with what you have. And therefore, you have to be very creative. I mean, I, I you know, we have a project where we were doing a, a kitchen remodel uh, as part of like a, a full gut remodel. And the the owner really wanted a walk-in pantry because she loves cooking. Mm. And it's, you know, it's it's anybody who loves cooking's dream being able to step in a in a room that has everything that you need, that you can see, you can access, like, you know, it's, it's it feels like a professional kitchen almost, right? Except that with that footprint of a house, we couldn't have that. There's just couldn't no fit. space where we could fit that unless we were using the room adjacent to it for that, but then we were missing a piece of the program. So that could not work. So we came up with the idea of, well, you know, I feel like in, in those scenarios, you kind of have to rethink about your standard way of thinking about those spaces and program elements. Agreed. So Typically, a pantry is a room with a door, you step in, there is showers all around you, and you have all of your food laid out. Well, does it have to be a room? No. What what makes it a, a, a pantry versus a cabinet? Well, it's its size, it's its scale, it's its height, right? Accessibility, ease of use. So we came up with the idea of actually uh, making one of the wall a bit deeper, so we can use the depth to create pretty much like what you would call like a full height cabinet. Yeah. That is basically an, a, a pantry in elevation, meaning that instead of having to dig through multiple layers of boxes of pasta, you just have everything laid out on one layer. So you open the door and you can see absolutely everything you own in your pantry at, you know, at a glance. And, the, you know, the owner absolutely loved that solution. It was very unique to their home because that solution came because of the constraint of the home, of the floor plan, of what was available, yeah. while responding to their specific needs and lifestyle. And that's actually kind of a fun, surprising feature in the kitchen, 
you know, that would not probably not have existed if it was a new construction because you would have had the typical walk-in pantry. I think what you're describing is, again, thinking about the end result and more specifically what the design is supposed to give you in terms of performance and user interface, let's say, and then working backward from there, right? So a pantry gives you easy access to things, allows you to see things more clearly, perhaps. And from that, it's like, okay, well, why don't we squish the pantry, make it very, very shallow and make it just an entire wall instead of a, a cube space that you walk into like a closet. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's issues like, okay, what do you store your appliances? Well, appliances were accommodated in another space in the kitchen. So it's that kind of like deconstructing the thoughts and abandoning preconceptions of what things should be to solve something. I think another example that comes to mind is, and this is also an example of how I think a, a, real, a very small level of construction can make a big impact, is we had a remodel and there was this big blank wall in the, the main main floor of the house. This big empty white wall that is there, and all of us were kind of scratching our heads like, what do we do with this dominating white wall? Um, and, you know, we could add to it. Uh, that would have been costly and would have also probably disrupted the flow. And the solution was, instead of doing like heavy construction, to do a wall art installation that kind of very lightly occupied um, the entire wall, but without being dominating. And what's cool about that is that it's actually, when I think about it, it's not a really a classically architectural solution, right? It's an art solution to an architectural problem. And I think that's also where when you're doing remodels uh, as as an architect or designer, it is very cool because it, it, it forces you to 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 come up with like unique ideas and solutions um, that you wouldn't again not have thought about beforehand. Um, that's not a typical thing you would do with a wall uh, if you're designing, let's say, a brand new house. But in this case, it made total sense. Yeah, and that show, again shows you the level of intervention, right? Like you could tear down the wall, you could, or you could just put a piece of art on it, and it becomes something completely different. So, again, you really have to gauge the amount of intervention, effort, budget, meaning, hierarchy, priorities in remodel projects. And I think the end goal is when you can come up with something. Like from from an insider's perspective, it, it feels right because it 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 is almost surprising you as the person who came up with it, and it feels right because you're not just putting a band aid on the situation. You're not compromising. You're not saying, oh, we don't have the room, so we do kind of a half measure. We don't have the room, so we don't have it. We don't have the room. We don't have the ability to do X, Y, and Z. So now it becomes this new thing, and that new thing solves the problem, but it's also something very different and offers you know, a uh, new program, perhaps, right? Yeah, no, and I, you know, that's something I, I, I don't think I would ever give up on a, on an idea or like something that a client would, would ask for unless it's absolutely impossible. Like the challenge is, is to try and make it work. That's mm -hmm. part of like our creative job is, is to find a solution. And I do believe every time there is a solution for everything, right? And everything is possible. It depends on budget, but everything is possible. And, and coming up with the solution, working with constraints and challenges and, and not giving up is, I think, it is, I think, quality you need to have if you work on remodel projects. I think so. And actually, frankly, I think remodels almost require more problem solving skills than oh, new yeah. construction. Oh, yeah. Um, Actually, I would say that would work. It, it, it does. It does. Uh, new construction is easy because it's just like a blank slide. You tear down the house or it's a blank slide to begin with. And everything you build, everything you do is whatever you want, just worth working you know, with the site. Uh, remodels are absolutely not that way. When it comes to construction, one of the things, one of the, the approaches or mentalities that we have, and I think that any architect would have to have, is to be very, very responsive and adaptable because again things are not going or things are not going to go according according to plan they're and not, new construction but like 10 times more for remodels they're not and uh, <clears throat> i think as an architect you have to be like you said like, um uh, res 
responsive. Mm. You know, like your 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 contractors and and his crew are on site, and you know they just open a wall and found this condition. Well, the project is going to stall until a solution is found. Mm-hmm. So you have to be quick at picking up the phone, coming up with solutions, being quick at reacting and and kind of analyzing all of the options and which one is best and the impacts and and being really like communicating the issue to the client, to the contractor and and you know discussing all of that. So you know, I think that's why also it, it it's important for clients to find architects who do, for example, let's say remodel work in this situation. Agreed. Because I think if you hire architects who maybe or designers who only work on new construction it's a different beast. It's different. It's a different beast. It's a different person in itself. It's a different personality and interest and being game for those kinds of challenges or not. So again, you want to find the right fit. Because like any non-architects listening, you have to realize that architects and designers, we live mostly and we work mostly in the conceptual space, in the drawing space. So most of our effort is, you know, ideating and and drawing and creating this this documentation set is planning. We plan, 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 plan for like a year and then it gets built, right? And what happens with remodels is like 30% of the effort um, it is it goes, goes toward the construction phase, you know? So it's no longer, oh, I just do the planning and then during construction, I just do CA in a typical sense. You know, I do planning, but I also have to do more planning and more design throughout construction. Yeah. And and on a, from a creative standpoint, sometimes it, it, it is it, it can be frustrating when you spend all this time creating this vision, and you get to construction. Oh, you got to change it. Like what? <laughs> that was perfect. I don't want to have to change it. Yeah. So I think um, having someone who expects that and enjoys that, like we do, is a very very important thing. Um, and it, it gets more to maybe personalities in in a sense, but. Like I would describe remodels, I would describe new construction, like there's a Rubik's cube. You look at the Rubik's cube, you know your path to get there, and then you solve it. Remodels are like, you look at that Rubik's cube, you start solving it, and then it changes again in the middle of when you're trying to solve it. And that's very much what it's like to kind of go through that process. It also means, I think, because you mentioned uh, communication, that for us, our approach is obviously to be available, to be responsive and all those things, yes. But when it comes to conversing with the client, there's there's a little more tact that's involved. You have to know how to break bad news, honestly. Um, but you also have to know kind of how much information the client needs. You're not keeping them in the dark, but you don't want to panic them, but there's no reason to panic. So it's a good idea usually for us, if there's a problem, we talk to the other project stakeholders like the contractor or the engineer or whatever else and say, okay, let's brainstorm. What are the solutions we have for this before we hit the client with a bunch of problems? Because no one wants to hear problems without solutions. Yeah. So as final thoughts, here's just some kind of like common things that we see as we do remodel projects. I would say the biggest one is probably working out the floor plan. <laughs> yes. And that that makes sense, right? Because yeah. at the time these homes were designed and built, people were living very differently from what we're living now. Everybody was in their separate rooms separate and there was hallways and boxes and everything was segregated and you know, people didn't want to see each other when they were living together, so there was that. Nowadays, we want the flow to be much more present in the floor plan. We want spaces to open up to each other. We like the people relationship. People didn't want to see each other. Yeah, yeah no, I was joking. <laughs> but you know, so it makes sense. And 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 this is really kind of like the even 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 if before you even think about like your kitchen cabinet color, mm. like that is really what's at the core of most home remodels. And I'm not sure that a lot of people are aware of that or actually think about it very much. True. But I think you could most of the time, most of the cases make a home much better just by reworking the flow and the floor plan before even thinking about f- fancy finishes. I totally agree. And I think that's one of, the, again, the the common differences from when, when clients approach us versus what we bring to the table when we first talk about what should happen to improve it. Earlier, we were talking about the scope. And, and a lot of times, from what, from what I recall, people come with a list of scope and we're like, okay, let's ignore that and just talk about what your goals are. And they're like, what? I want to talk about tile. And the other thing is that people come in, again, with specific stuff like finishes and whatever else. We're like, well, let's talk about flow. <laughs> but flow is absolutely the case. And and, and they're, a, a lot of the older, the tract homes are, don't have great floor plans. 
And frankly, a lot of the new homes too also have horrible floor plans. And uh, for <laughs> most houses, it um, it does start with an understanding of the floor plan because that's how we we as humans exist. We walk around, and that's how circulation is felt. Um, I think also another common thing we see is people who are living in more traditional or whatever other style of house, and they want something that's fully modern and contemporary or a little more that way. And for us, in both those cases, they're interesting projects to do. Um, because again, you have to work with, with what's there. And something that you were, you were bringing up the other day is, and a, a project we have ongoing, is there's this house and it has pitched roofs. And the question is, how do you make it feel contemporary while still having pitched roofs? You could do the whole like no eaves kind of mm -hmm. Danish, you know, <laughs> Ikea looking box thing. They're not Danish, they're Swedish. But you could do that. But if you're not doing that, like what else do you do to achieve a contemporary home with that, those types of shapes? And that becomes very interesting for us. I mean, that's the, the types of problems that I think I like to solve. Yeah, and I, I think also the other thing is that um, every time we finish a remodel, clients are thrilled. They feel like their home is like a completely new home, which makes me think that maybe you don't need to move out and buy or build a new home necessarily. You know, maybe there is ways if you like where you are in your home to fix it, to make mm -hmm. it what you want it to be now. Um, so that's something to consider. Another thing that we notice a lot is that remodels are kind of tricky in scope creep in scope creep and that's usually mostly for like smaller scale remodels let's get let's say you just want to remodel your kitchen and your bathroom and that's kind of all you want to be doing yeah. it's very hard to make those it's very easy for us to make those better right but it's very hard for it to work with the rest of the house when they're complete because they look so much better than the rest of the house so there is a temptation at some point to just keep adding to the remodel scope which is fine if the budget is there um, but it's also something that i think people have to realize yeah uh, especially if you have a limited budget is that you know it's really hard to talk about some of these things without have knowing the specific uh, client and the project because yeah. it all varies but i would say that generally from what we've seen if you have this thing this in this case let's say it's this bathroom that was not part of the scope initially but you're really thinking about doing it so you're on the fence if you're on the fence about whatever the thing is it could be a bathroom it could be a whole addition it could be repainting this thing it could be whatever scale right if you're on the fence and you can afford to do it, there's a 99% chance you should just do it. Because 90% of the time, after we start work on that addition, and we're already in construction, the client says, I wanna do this other thing now at, at the main house. And we're like, okay, well, certainly can do that, but it's gonna take time, because now we have to design the thing, go through that whole process, right? And so, yeah, like you said, once you start pulling at that thread, it becomes difficult from a, 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 a client standpoint to kind of make a decision, right? Like, I'm, I'm hesitant, but I think I should, I don't know. And then also because once you start ripping down walls, you start to see, okay, that's wrong. And that leads to this thing that's wrong. Should I fix that thing now? If I fix that thing, then I got to fix this thing too. And it's very easy for the, like, where do you draw the line kind of? Yeah, and it's also kind of risky because then you just kind of start making just small in, a bunch of small intervention mm -hmm. and that whole vision just starts to break into pieces or never come into one big piece so i think it's it's something to consider if you cannot afford let's say um doing this two bathroom remodel but you're doing everything else mm -hmm. my advice i think if as much as possible is get those bathroom designed you know schematically just so you have the vision for them. And once you have the funds to do the construction, then go ahead and build them. But at least they are part of that design vision as part of the other spaces. Mm. Because if you do that, you know, 10 years later, you might hire someone else or you might not. But even if you are the same person, they're in a different mindset. They are not in the same mindset as they were when they designed the rest of the house. So in that the spirit of keeping the vision, you know, cohesive and together, I would just at least get it conceptually designed, and then you can phase the construction out in however sequences you need to. Yeah, and that brings up the topic of, of phasing. Um, and there's another example that comes to mind of uh, 
a, a client has a house, they want to do work on their house. They also want to acquire the property next to it, build a guest house on that property and have the two um, feel like they're one big kind of estate. And uh, that's a very I intriguing, you know, uh, project to do uh, just, you know, personally, subjectively. It's a very intriguing problem to solve and you have to be very specific with how you go about doing that so the two feel like they were meant to be together um in all aspects and in, in design and then you know construction execution for sure and and i think a, a lot of times or sometimes folks yeah they they want to phase out work like they want to do a lot of um remodeling to the main house for example but they have plans to build an adu in the backyard mm -hmm. or they have plans to do that plus a pool house or whatever other kinds of structures. And uh, it makes total sense that you would, you would have the same architect, as you said, at least do the concept designs and then build them later if you want to. Um, in both those cases though, you, 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 you have to use the same architect because they all exist on one site. They're not separate houses in other places, right? So you need not just the individual structures like the ADU and pool house to look like it matches the language of the main house. More importantly, perhaps you need the site plan to work um, in both the examples I gave. At the end of the day, I have to say, I do love remodeling projects and of any size. I mean, the bigger, more complex, the more satisfying it is for me, for example, as, a, as, a, as an architect, but um, there is no minimum size for a remodel. And I think, what I love about remodels is feeling like I'm making a home better, like one at a time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like mission. there is so many, honestly, there is so many homes that need love out mm. there that if I feel like I could help just a little bit here and there, like it, it makes me feel good, you know? Yeah. yeah. Maybe clients would be surprised by this, but for a lot of architects, certainly including ourselves, it's not about the size of the project. Like yeah. at all. Um, I mean, at some point when things get really small, then, then it becomes challenging. But it, it's even then, it's about just the quality and the people that you're working with. If it's going to be a good quality and they're good people, then why not? Let's do it. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. So if you have a remodel, just uh, <laughs> hit us up. <laughs> uh, so outro. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this recording, you can leave the show review. Uh, the show is in the Apple Podcast app and Spotify and on YouTube. Of course, we have our office, so you can check us out uh, through the office as well. The podcast has an Instagram, and it's on social media everywhere. You've probably seen it on Instagram. We, we <laughs> often come across architects who are like, hey, I recognize you. I'm like, yeah, like, oh, our no. faces are out there. <laughs> um, we also have a hotline, uh, which is 213-222-6950. So you can call it, go straight to voicemail, leave a message, or text it for any comments, questions, or suggestions on topics. Anything else? Website podcast has a website which is secondstudiopod.com you can find all the episodes by category on there and for other project companion episodes the website has them neatly categorized good all right thank you very much talk soon bye 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 <laughs>